Hello everyone, welcome to Maths Used in Quantum Computing Part 1. A quick intro. We know that quantum mechanics is based on linear algebra. The general theory uses infinite dimensional vector spaces. Fortunately for us, to describe a spin or a polarization, we only need finite dimensions. In this video, we will use real numbers instead of complex numbers, because real numbers are straightforward to use, while complex numbers are more complicated. Complex numbers provide an elegant way of connecting trigonometric and exponential functions using Euler's formula, that's why we will need them in future videos. So, for what we are going to do, complex numbers are not needed, but we will get back to them in future videos. But for now, and for the sake of simplicity, we will be only using real numbers. So, let's get started. So let's start with vectors. A vector is just a list of numbers. The dimension of the vector is the number of numbers in the list. As we can see, the coordinates of vector v are 2 and 1, and the dimension of this vector is 2. If the list is written vertically, we call it a column vector, or a cat, and we write it as follow. If the list is written horizontally, we call it a row vector, or a bra, and we write it as a horizontal vector. The names bra and cat come from Paul Dirac. Dirac was one of the founders of quantum mechanics and his notation is used extensively throughout both quantum mechanics and quantum computing. He also introduced notation for naming these two types of vectors, a cat with the name v is denoted by cat v, a bra with the name w is denoted by bra w, so we might write a cat v as a column vector, a bra w as a horizontal vector. Later, we will see why we use two different symbols to surround the name, and the reason that tells us which side the angled bracket goes. But for now, the important thing is to remember that cats refer to columns. Just think of the repeated K sound, in cat and columns, and that bras, as usual, have their entries arranged horizontally. Now, let's take a look at diagrams of vectors. Vectors in two or three dimensions can be pictured as arrows. We will look at an example using cat A equals the column vector 3 and 1. In what follows, we will often use cats for our example, but if you like, you can replace them with bras. The first entry 3 in this example gives the change in the x coordinate from the initial point to the terminal point. The second entry gives the change in the y coordinate going from the initial point to the terminal point. We can draw this vector with any initial point. Notice that if the initial point is drawn at the origin, the terminal point has coordinates given by the entries of the vector. This is convenient and we will often draw them in this position. And as you can see on the screen, the same cat is drawn in different positions with different initial points. Now, let's take a look at the lengths of vectors. The length of a vector is, as might be expected, the distance from its initial point to its terminal point. This is the square root of the sum of squares of the entries. This comes from the Pythagorean theorem. We denote the length of a cat A as a cat A between two bars. So for a cat A that equals the entries 3 and 1, we have the length of a cat A equals the square root of the sum of 3 squared and 1 squared, which equals the square root of 10. More generally, if a cat A equals the column vector of the entries a1, a2, and so on to an, then the length of a cat A is equal to the square root of the sum of a1 squared and a2 squared all the way to an squared. A final note that you should remember is that vectors of length 1 are called unit vectors. Later, we will see that qubits are represented by unit vectors. Now, let's take a look at scalar multiplication. We can multiply a vector by a number. In linear algebra, numbers are often called scalars. Scalar multiplication just refers to multiplying by a number. We do this by multiplying each of the entries by the given number. For example, 
Multiplying the get A by the number C gives us the resultant vector CA1, CA2 all the way to CAN. It is straightforward to check that multiplying a vector by a positive number C multiplies its length by a factor of C. You can pause this video for a minute to check this fact through this example. We can use this fact to enable us to get vectors of different lengths pointing in the same direction. In particular, we will often want to have a unit vector pointing in the direction given by a non-unit vector. Given any non-zero vector of get A, its length is the length of get A. If we multiply get A by the inverse of its length, we obtain a unit vector. For example, as we have already seen, if get A equals the entries 3 and 1, then its length is equal to the square root of 10. If we let get U equals the inverse of square root of 10 multiplied by the entries 3 and 1, then we would obtain the length of U to be equal to 1, and we would call this unit vector as we saw previously. Consequently, get U is a unit vector that points in the same direction as get A. Now, let's take a look at vector addition. Given two vectors that have the same type, they are both bras or both gets, and they have the same dimension, we can add them to get a new vector of the same type and dimension. The first entry of this vector just comes from adding the first entries of the two vectors, the second entry from adding the two second entries, and so on. For example, we have the two vectors a and b. By adding them, we would have the resultant vector 4 and 3. Vector addition can be pictured by what is often called the parallelogram law for vector addition. If the vector of ket b is drawn so that its initial point is at the terminal point of ket a, then the vector that goes from the initial point of ket a to the terminal point of ket b is ket a plus b. This can be drawn given a triangle. We can interchange the rows of ket a and ket b draw on the initial point of ket a at the terminal point of ket b. The vector that goes from the initial point of ket b to the terminal point of ket a is ket b plus a. Again, this gives a triangle. But we know that ket a plus b is equal to ket b plus a. So if we draw the triangle construction for ket a plus b and ket b plus a, where both the vectors have the same initial and terminal points, the two triangles connect to give us a parallelogram with a diagonal representing both ket a plus b and ket b plus a. Now, let's check what orthogonal vectors means. The previous drawing helps us visualize some basic properties of vector addition. One of the most important comes from the Pythagorean theorem. We know that if A, B and C represent the lengths of the three sides of a triangle, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared, if and only if the triangle is a right triangle. The drawing then tells us that the two vectors, ket A and ket B, are perpendicular if and only if the length of ket A squared plus the length of ket B squared equals the length of A plus B squared. The word orthogonal means exactly the same thing as perpendicular, and it is the word that is usually used in linear algebra. We can restate our observation by saying that two vectors, ket A and ket B, are orthogonal if and only if the length of ket A squared plus the length of ket B squared equals the length of ket A plus B squared. Now, let's check how to multiply a bra by a ket. If we have a bra and a ket of the same dimension, we can multiply them, the bra on the left and the ket on the right, to obtain a number. This is done in the following way, where we suppose that both bra A and ket B are n-dimensional. We use concatenation to denote the product. This just means that we write down the same terms side by side, with no symbol between them. So the product is written as bra A and ket B, by squeezing the symbols even closer. The vertical lines coincide and we get the following expression, which is the notation we will use. The definition of the bracket product is the following. The vertical lines of the bra and kets are pushed together, 
which helps us to remember that the bra has the vertical line on the right side and the cat has it on the left. The result consists of terms sandwiched between angle brackets. The name bra and cat come from bracket, which is almost the concatenation of the two names. Though this is a rather weak play on words, it does help us to remember that for this product that the bra is to the left of the cat. In linear algebra, this product is often called the inner product or the dot product. But the bracket notation is the one used in quantum mechanics, and it is the one that we will use throughout this series. Now that we have defined the bracket product, let's see what we can do with it. We start by revisiting lengths. Brackets and lengths. If we have a cat denoted by cat A, then the bra with the same name is defined in the obvious way. They both have exactly the same entries, but for cat A they are arranged vertically, and for bra A horizontally. Consequently, the bracket of A and A would equal the sum of the entries A1 squared, A2 squared, all the way to AN squared. And so the length of cat A can be written as the square root of the bracket A and A. To illustrate, we return to the example where we found the length of cat A to be equal to the square root of 10. Unit vectors are going to become very important in our study. To see whether a vector is unit, it means it has the length 1, we will repeatedly use the fact that a cat A is a unit vector if and only if the bracket of A and A would equal to 1. Another important concept is orthogonality. The bracket product can also tell us when two vectors are orthogonal. The key result is that two cats A and B are orthogonal if and only if the bracket of A and B equals 0. We will look at a couple of examples and then give an explanation of why this result is true. Let cat A equals the entry 3 and 1, cat B equals the entry 1 and 2, and cat C equals the entry minus 2 and 6. We calculate the bracket of A and B and the bracket of A and C. We would find the result of the bracket A and B would equal to 5 and the bracket of A and C equals 0. Since the bracket of A and B is not equal to 0, we know that cat A and cat B are not orthogonal. Since the bracket of A and C equals 0, we know that cat A and cat C are orthogonal. Why does this work? Here's an explanation for two-dimensional cat. Let cat A and cat B equals the following entries. Then the addition of cat A and cat B would equal the entries A1 plus B1 and A2 plus B2 as we saw previously. We calculate the square of the length of cat A plus cat B and we would find the result to be equal to the length of cat A squared plus the length of cat B squared plus the product of 2 and bracket A and B. Clearly, this number equals the length of cat A squared plus the length of cat B squared if and only if the product of 2 and bracket A and B equals 0. Now, recall our observation that two vectors, cat A and cat B, are orthogonal if and only if the length of cat A squared plus the length of cat B squared equals the length of cat A plus B squared. We can restate this observation using our calculation for the square of the length of cat A plus cat B to say that two vectors, cat A and cat B, are orthogonal if and only if the bracket of A and B equals 0. Though we have shown this for two-dimensional cats, the same argument can be extended to cats of any size. Now, let's see what orthonormal basis means. The word orthonormal has two parts, ortho from orthogonal and normal from normalized, which in this instance means unit. If we are working with two-dimensional cats, an orthonormal basis will consist of a set of two unit cats that are orthogonal to one another. In general, if we are working with n-dimensional cats, an orthonormal basis consists of a set of n unit cats that are mutually orthogonal to one another. We begin by looking at two-dimensional cats. 
The set of all two-dimensional vectors is denoted by R squared. An orthonormal basis for R squared consists of a set containing two unit vectors of ket B1 and ket B2 that are orthogonal. So, given a pair of kets to check whether they form an orthonormal basis, we must check first to see if they are unit vectors, and then check whether they are orthogonal. We can check both of these conditions using brackets. So, we need the bracket of B1 and B1 to be equal to 1, the bracket of B2 and B2 to be equal to 1, and the bracket of B1 and B2 to be equal to 0. You can check this fact through the standard example, which is called the standard basis of states 0 and 1. Now, let's check what ordered basis means. An ordered basis is a basis in which the vectors have been given an order. That is, there is a first vector, a second vector, and so on. So if we have the vectors b1, b2 to bn, is a basis, we will denote the ordered basis by b1, b2 to bn. We just change the brackets from curly to round. For an example, if we have the standard basis of states 0 and 1, then, the basis of state 0 and state 1 is equal to the basis of state 1 and state 0. On the other hand, the ordered basis of state 0 and state 1 is not equal to the ordered basis of state 1 and state 0.